Okay. In the previous lecture, we defined the noisy flows of the graph. And we proved that for the plane graph, the graph has a noise error k flow if and on if its geometric dual is k colorable. So if you apply that to a planar graph, then you actually have the following thing that the four color theorem that so four color theorem is actually equivalent to the statement that every planar graph with no cut edge has a nowhere zero k flow. Why? Because four color theorem is every loopless planar graph is four colorable. Why did I remove loop? Because if I have a loop, then uh, I don't, I mean, in our course, normally it's not. Normally people say that if you have a loop, just ignore. But for our course, we will say that if a graph has a loop, then it's not k colorable for any k. Because a vertex is adjacent to itself, so you can never make a coloring so that adjacent vertices have distinct colors. And when you take a geometric dual, then the loops become cut edges, and cut edges become loop. Okay? So every loopless planar graph is four colorable. Then when you take a geometric dual, then you deduce a statement saying that every planar graph with no cut edge has a noise or, case, a noise or a full flow. So this is uh, one of the major motivations to study noise or K flow. Instead of uh, thinking of coloring, we may have a better chance studying uh, noise or K flow. And actually, there's a uh, very strange situation. So you may ask, is it true that every graph with no cut edge has a nowhere zero ball flow? The answer is actually no. You will see from the homework that Peterson graph is a count example. So Peterson graph is a 10 vertex graph that appears many times in graph theory. And um, this is count example. However, there is a very strange property. Let me say theorem. There is a constant k. such that every graph with no cut edge has a no way zero k flow. This is highly surprising because we have seen that the noiser k flow is kind of dual to the graph coloring, right? Vertex coloring. So graph has noiser k flow if and only if its geometric dual has k coloring for planar graphs. So you may wonder whether the similar phenomena hold, like chromatic number could be arbitrary, right? You have a graph with huge chromatic number, so chromatic number could be big. So is it is it like, could it be similar that you, can you have a graph which doesn't admit no way zero, like million flow? And yet, has no way zero million one flow? Actually, no. And this is a conjecture by Todd. In 1954, he conjectured that 
uh, if k is 5 this could be true and this is still open so far what's known is uh, when k is 8 then there's a relatively simple proof by Zhe in 1975 and for k is 6 it's proved by Seymour in 1981 we're gonna see both proofs in this course okay so in order to understand these proofs we need a, a, a different generalization of another k flux now we'll talk about no zero gk flow Okay, so what is GK? GK is like something like this. Right? I mean, we are talking about modulo K. Right? So when you add two numbers, it becomes again uh, a number between 0 and K minus 1. All right, so let's define everything precisely. So a GK circulation. Okay, I'm, let me just copy from left to right. All right. So maybe I copy this. Copy and oops, paste here. Yes, good. So what is the GK circulation? GK circulation of a graph is a function from set of edges to GK such that this is modular K. Oh, okay, let's not say it. Yeah, I mean it's G. Still integers. But now when you compare the sum of incoming and sum of outgoing, I'm only gonna compare with respect to this modular k. And then for positive integer k, no way zero gk flow is a gk circulation phi such that phi e is never zero modulo k all right does that make sense so everything is same except whenever we compare two numbers we use modulo k all right so it's clear that every uh, no other k flow is a no other g k flow, right? But the converse is not true, right? You might have a no other g k flow which is not no other k flow. For instance, let me draw k three three. If I put every one, every edge one. And this is nowhere zero G3 flow. Why? Oh, by the way, every edge has direction to the right. This is nowhere zero G3 flow, but not a nowhere zero 3 flow, right? Because for every vertex, the sum of incoming edges is 3 or 0. Sum of outgoing edges is 3 or 0. So these two numbers are equal modul up to modulo 3. So now you may ask the following. What graphs admit in the way 0 GK flow? Right? 
trivially, if you have a class of graphs admitting the weather k okay flow, If there is no way zero k flow, then you, we know that there is no way zero zk flow, right? How about the converse? Let's try with a simple case. What happens if k is two? Right? So let's uh, suppose that G has no as or okay, G2 flow. What does that mean? That means for every vertex, so the sum of incoming edges is equal to the sum of outgoing edges. But every edge has a value 1 because, I mean, I can, because it's non. Every edge has value odd, right? So mo up to modulo 2, it's 1. The sum of incoming is equal to sum of outgoing, but minus 1 is equal to 1 in modulo 2, so therefore, it just is a number of edges, right? Except the, for, for if you have a loop, then it's, it doesn't count, right? So every vertex of G is incident with even number of non-loop edges, right? That's what we got. So then G is Eulerian, I mean, this is definition. Euler, graph is Eulerian if every vertex has even degree. So every component of G with at least one edge has an Eulerian circuit. Right? So that means if I have an Eulerian circuit, and if I have an Eulerian circuit, I can follow these edges and put one everywhere. That will give me a um, uh, no other two flow. What about the cumbers? If I have no other two flow, then I mean, I, yeah, I don't have to worry about the cumbers because, okay. So this is equal, this, is, this implies that, this implies that, this implies this, and this implies that, right? So everything is equivalent, right? If graph is no other 2 flow, then it has no other G2 flow. So everything is equivalent. So when K is 2, we deduce that, aha, uh -huh, graph has no other G2 flow, if and only if graph has no other 2 flow. Now let's, what happens, what if G is a plane graph? And then this is equivalent to the statement that the, the geometric dual is too colorable. That means G, geometric dual is bipartite, right? So this implies that for the plane graph, the geometric dual is bipartite if and only if uh, it is Eulerian. And you may, you may have seen a similar homework problem. All right. 
So anyway, for k, when k is 2, we know that having no way 0 g2 flow is same as having no way 0 2 flow. Now, what about uh, the bigger k? It turns out that this is true. And this is again a theorem of Tut. Well, let me not say that. Uh, okay, so let G be a directed graph. And G has a nowhere zero K flow. If and only if G has a nowhere zero GK flow. Right? So forward direction is trivial, right? Because every k flow is no zero g k flow. What's more interesting is the converse. Okay, so suppose g has a no zero g k flow. Right. Hmm. Now we're gonna. Uh, so, right. So, what does that mean? This means we have a function phi on the edge set to the integers such that first condition is for every edge e of g phi of e is in like plus or minus one plus or minus two up to plus or minus k minus one i mean you i could <laughs> Just restrict to the one up to k minus one, but I, I'm gonna allow minus minus one, negative one up to negative k minus one. You will see the the reason why this is convenient. And for every vertex v and the sum of the incoming edges, no outgoing edges, is equal to sum of the incoming edges modulo k all right uh, let us write like this d phi as the sum of the gap between these two numbers. That's outgoing and that's incoming. And I'm summing over every vertex. Okay. So if d phi is zero, then that's exactly what we want. Right? Because uh, some of the absolute values of difference is d phi so if d phi is zero then that means everything is equal not only in modular k but actually uh, over the integers is equal so therefore it, we have the noise k flow so what we're gonna do is to choose phi okay we choose our function phi so that d phi is minimum we claim that d phi is zero which implies that phi is a no zero k flow all right 
Now, suppose the phi is chosen, yeah, so we are assuming the phi is chosen to minimize d phi. Now, now here is the place where we're going to use the symmetry by reversing on edge E and replace replacing phi e with the minus phi e, we may assume that phi e is positive for all edges e, right? If I have an edge which has negative values, and then I'm going to reverse the edge, and, right, so if I have an edge which is minus 1, then I'm going to reverse it with 1, and it doesn't change much. I mean, d phi is the same. Right? And it satisfies 1 and 2. Right? So, now, we take S to be the set of vertices so that the outgoing the sum of outgoing edges is bigger than sum of the incoming edges. And T be the set of vertices where the sum of outgoing edges is diff less than, strictly less than sum of incoming edges. Okay? So this is like, S is like source, right, which provides too much which sends too much, and then this is target, right, which demand too much. All right, so what's next? All right, so if, if G has a directed path, from S to T, let's say directed past P, right? So here's an S, here's a T. If I have a directed pass, what do I do? Then what we do is subtract the same value for every edge on the P. Okay, so we are defining phi prime. Well, we're gonna subtract like k everywhere on this path. Then, then phi prime satisfies one and two, right? Because we phi e was an integer from 1 up to k minus 1, if we subtract k, still it's uh, some number between minus 1 and minus k minus 1, right? So, you satisfy 1. So that's why it was convenient to make this to be plus minus 1 up to plus minus k minus 1. And this thing doesn't change because we subtract k, nothing should change. But D of the, right? But D of phi prime is D phi minus, right? Yeah, so when you look at this vertex, sum of increase, incoming edge is decreased by K, and sum of outgoing edge is decreased by K. So nothing changes. Right? The, the difference of sum of incoming and sum of outgoing is the same. But what about this vertex? Sum of incoming is the same, but sum of outgoing is decreased by k. And this is, is used to be the place where you send more, right? So sum of outgoing used to be a bit more, but now we are subtracting k because of vertex in s. And what about the vertex here? 
sum of incoming is decreased by k and here sum of incoming was more right so you subtract k from the bigger word the bigger bigger number so the sum of decrease sum of the difference is decreased by k so this is d5 minus 2k now this is strictly less than d5 right and that's a contradiction or something that d5 is chosen the phi is chosen to minimize d5 right so therefore g has no directed path from s to t here's an s and here's t so then I can find the set X, let X be the set of vertices that can be reached by a directed path from S, right? So every vertex here you can reach. Now, an x intersection s is x intersection t is empty. Oh, and you cannot have any edges going out from x because this is forbidden. Because then this vertex will be in s, be in x, right? So that's not allowed. So uh, there is no edge. from x to the outside of x and now let's add all these numbers okay, sum of the incoming edges minus sum of the outgoing edges in x then what what's happening so inside x we are adding For every edge, at this vertex you are adding this number, at this vertex you are subtracting this number. So every edge inside x, they cancel each other. So what's left is, what's left is for every edge coming out, you have sum, and for every edge coming into x, you subtract. But there's no edge coming out, right? This, this thing is empty set. So this is minus phi of e. All right. And I know that this number phi of e was positive. All right. So therefore this is not positive. Okay. It's not positive. Why is it not positive? Um, well, it might be uh, and delta minus x could be empty. So if this could be, if this is empty, then this is zero. So this number is zero. But when you look at this quantity, it's same as. This means that for every vertex in S, I mean this, okay, let me see. For each vertex in S, this difference is at least K. So K times S is lower bound for that, right? Because X can, everybody here, the difference is at least k. So this means s is at most zero, so s is empty. Hmm. Right. By symmetry, you 
You can also prove that t is empty. Why? Because just by considering uh, some of the vertices, naughtiness, right? It's by same argument. If we consider this, then for vertex in T, you have a minus K, and for vertex is not in T. I mean, if you, if you really want to have a symmetric, then this could be more convenient. Right, so this is at least K times T. Right? And you will prove that this is at most zero. All right, so T is empty. So S and T are empty. What does that mean? That means D phi is zero. Okay, so that means no, phi is a no zero K flow. So that's surprising. Right. So even though we define a more relaxed version of the definitions, we still have the same set of graphs admitting this. Now, let's do more relaxations. So we talked about no zero k flow. And then we talked about no zero um, GK flow. But how about no zero gamma flow for an abelian group gamma? So now we have something called the group valued flows can then can we extend the definition further so that more graphs can have a group valued flows than no k okay flow all right so that's the uh, next topic so let me again copy this whole statement copy and uh, paste All right so we define let gamma be an uh, additive abelian group by additive I mean the operation is plus All right so if you never took the uh, uh, algebra course, you can think of the groups to be something like G2 times G3 or this kind of thing is group. So when you have uh, two things, then A, B, A1, B1 plus A2, B2 is just a coordinate wise sum. Okay? So something like that. So the gamma circulation is a function that maps on edges to the gamma so that this is equal in gamma. Okay? And then the zero gamma flow is gamma circulation. And this is not equal to zero. All right? So no zero GK flow is if gamma if gamma is GK then this is exactly no zero GK flow, okay. All right, so let's see example. Right, some example. Uh, right. 
So at G B A uh, loop list three regular graph. Then when does it have a uh, no zero G two times G two flow? Then G has a no zero G two times G two flow. Okay, can you see that? If and on if. Right, so what does that mean? That means I have three regular graphs, so every vertex has degree three. And now in G2 times G2, the entries are 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. And note that minus x is equal to x in this group, right? Because minus 1 is equal to minus 1. And therefore, the direction of edges doesn't matter. Sum is same as subtractions. All right. So that means for every vertex, you're going to have um, one of these four. For, I mean, for every edge, you have, have one of these four values. But you cannot have a 0, 0, 0, 0. So you can have only these three. But if I do have 1, 0, 0, 1, but the last one cannot be 1, 0. If this is 1, 0, then their sum is not going to be 0. The only way the last edge could be is to add these two numbers together. Then all these three edges will have different, uh, different value. Right? If two of them have same value, let's say one zero, one zero, then last as become zero zero, become zeros. It's not a no no. It's not a no zero g two times g two flow. So this because of that, we see that g is three as colorable. Right? If you have a no zero g two times g two flow. Every edge has a value 1, 0, or 0, 1, or 1, 1, one of three values. And no two edges instantly with the same vertex will have the same value. So it's coloring. You can think of it as colors. And converse is true. If you have three edge coloring, then like red, blue, green, then you make a red to be 1, 0, green to be uh, 0, 1, and blue to be 1, 1, and still it's no way 0. 3 flow, no way 0 g2 times g2 flow. So graph has no way 0 g2 times g2 flow if and only if. I mean, for three, this is only for 3 regular graph. Every vertex is degree 3. For 3 regular graph, uh, it has no way 0 g2 times g2 flow if and only if. It's 3 gets colorable. Okay? So that's interesting in a sense. So can he characterize graphs, right? So no way zero. If I have a no way zero k flow, then I know that I have a no way zero g k flow. But can can you have something like gamma flow for some cases? Now here is a striking theorem. So theorem again due to Todd that that G be a directed graph. Then and let gamma one, gamma two be two abelian groups. same cardinality. Okay, so for some finite abelian groups. Then G has a nowhere zero gamma one flow if and only if G has a nowhere zero gamma two flow. So what's surprising is that the structure of a group doesn't do any role. 
all you need is the cardinality of the group. Right? What is the size of the group? That determines whether or not graph has a noise or gamma flow. Why is this true? We will define this thing that uh, n, n gamma of g be the number of nowhere zero gamma flows in of g. Oops. Okay. We claim that if gamma one is equal, the size is equal then number of noise gamma one flow is equal to number of noise gamma two flow. So not only the existence is equivalent, but actually the number of flows is equal. So if both are non-zero, if one of them is non-zero, then the other is non-zero. If one of them is zero, then the other is zero. All right, that's the statement. So we proceed by induction on on number of edges. Okay. If all edges of G are loops, so that's a simple case. We want to first treat the base case. If every edge is a loop, right? Then you can assign any value from the any non-zero values to every edge, right? So n gamma i g is just a size of gamma minus size of gamma i minus one to the number of edges, right? So this is equal. Oh yeah, let's 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 write this as k. Let k be the size of gamma one, which is equal to size of gamma two. So the number of noise or k flow, no noise or gamma flow is equal to k minus one to the number of edges. This is constant. In that case, it's easy. So we can assume that there is an edge which is not a loop. So there is an edge E which is not a loop. Yes. Now we claim the following. Number of noise zero gamma one flow is equal to number of noise zero gamma one in G contract E minus number of noise zero gamma one flows gamma I, gamma I and G DDD. Okay, we contract something, minus, you don't have edges here. And it's actually easy to observe. Why? Because number of, number of, number of gamma i flow here, it's uh, what it was. This is, Be equal to this to the number of uh, circulations gamma i circulations phi so that phi of f is non zero for all f other than e. Yeah. So inside such as circulations, 
right? What should I say? These are people, so this is number of them is nowhere zero, gamma i flow, number of that is nowhere zero, gamma i flow of g delta d, right? These are the same as number of gamma i circulations phi so that uh, phi of e is zero and phi of f is non-zero for all f not equal to e these are the number of gamma i circulations phi so that phi of e is non-zero and phi of f is non-zero for all f, right? So when you add them together, trivially you get this. When you add these thing, two things together, you get this. So that's this equation. All right. Now, now what's left is quite trivial. By induction, oops. We know that the uh, number of nowhere zero gamma one flow of G country E is equal to number of nowhere zero uh, gamma two flows of G country E. And similarly, deletion, you have the same number. So this implies that number of nowhere zero gamma one flow of G is equal to number of nowhere zero gamma two flow. That's it. Okay, so that gives you a theorem due to thought that uh, when you have a finite abelian group, then G has a nowhere zero gam flow if and only if G has a nowhere zero size of a gamma flow. That's surprising, right? I mean, this this also gives a calories. For instance, uh, if k prime is less than equal to k, then And G has a nowhere zero uh, G, G K prime flow, then G has a nowhere zero G K flow. Is this trivial? Yes, it is. I mean, I mean, we don't need that strong theory, but uh, <laughs> anyway, this is one consequence. Another thing is, uh, right? Suppose that G is three regular. Loop is three regular graph. Then. G has a nowhere zero four flow if and only if G is three edge colorable. Why? Because of this example, right? Graph has nowhere zero, nowhere zero. Graph has three edge colorable. Graph is three edge colorable if and only if graph has nowhere zero g2 times g2 flow and g2 times g2 has size 4 so therefore nowhere zero 4 flow it's equivalent to having a nowhere zero 4 flow now why is this interesting especially for four color theorem why is this interesting so what is the consequence Right. 
If I want to prove the Foucault theorem, I can assume that graph is a triangulation. What is triangulation? Triangulation is, right? So, yeah, we may assume that G is a plane, plane triangulation. That is, simple plane graph in which every face is bounded by a triangle. Cycle of length three. Because otherwise I can always add an edge to split, right? If I have a, for instance, if this is a face, I can try to add this. If it doesn't work, that means I might have an edge out, outside that looks like this. So if it doesn't work, I can, in this case, I can try to add uh, this edge, right? So in one, so in either this method work without creating any uh, parallel edges, or this will do the job, right? So one of these two choices will give you the. Uh, give you more edges. So you, you can keep adding more edges to the planar graph while keeping simple and planar. And if you can no longer do it, then, mean, then every face is a triangle. So that's plane triangulation. So in order to prove full color theorem, you can, I mean, it's okay to add more edges because it, it will only make it harder. Right? So if we want to prove the Volcala theorem, it's enough to prove it for plane triangulations. So suppose G is, is plane triangulation. And H is the geometric dual of G. So what is H? H is a graph that has that is three regular, right? And it's plane graph. And we may assume, we may also assume G it. I mean, actually, G is uh, three connected. Okay, why not? I mean, if graph is not three, uh, we don't need that much. But so we may assume G has no no loops, right? and no cottage, right? So then that implies that H has no roofs, no cottages, right? Loops become cottages and cottages become loops in the geometric dual. So no cottages implies that no roofs, no roofs implies that no cottages in the dual. Uh, actually, I don't, I don't have to say we may assume because it's automatic, right? Graph has no loops and no cut edges because it's uh, triangulations. So, so H is a three regular plane graph that has no loops and no cut edges. Now, four color theorem is equivalent to proving that G is four colorable, which is equivalent to prove that H has a no edge of four flow. This is equivalent to prove that H has a no way zero G4 flow, for instance, or H has a no way zero G2 times G2 flow, right? Because 
g2 times g2 has cardinality 4 and g4 has cardinality 4 and that means h is 3 as colorable so what does that mean so four color theorem is equivalent to prove the following statements every uh, Uh, loop list three regular plane graph with the uh, no cut edges is three as color okay and this was actually proved by this equivalence is proved by tight in 18, <laughs> 1880. So every, uh, um, if I don't have a loop and three regular, can I have a parallel edges? No. If I have a parallel edges, then, so I, I think it's okay just to replace this loop list by Yeah, so let me rewrite better, slightly better formulation. Every simple, instead of loop list, if I have, yeah, if I have loop, then you will have a cut edges anyway. So every simple two edge connected right, if you look at the component, then you don't, you don't have any cut edges, so it's a two edge connected. It's the regular planner graph is 3 as color so that's equivalent right so the vertex coloring problem become edge coloring problem okay so that's interesting so in the next lecture I'm gonna show you several conjectures of thought and we will see uh, some of the consequences okay that's it